Uh, hello everyone, welcome to this new seminar from the Instituto of Astrofísica de Galicia. Today we have the pleasure to have the talk by Luis Alberto Díaz uh, García. So Luis uh, made his PhD at the Centro de Estudios de Física del Cosmos de Aragón, the CEFCA, in 2017 as part of the Alhambra and J. Bruce collaborations. And between 2019 and 2020, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Academia Sinica Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics in Taipei. Since mid-2020, he is a several job postdoctoral fellow here at the AAA, working with the Stellar Population Group. And here he works on data validation tasks and galaxy evolution researches in the mini j survey. So during his career, he has participated in many galaxy evolution studies, contributing to the study of the stellar population properties of galaxies, formation and evolution of galaxies, stellar mass and luminosity functions, galaxy mergers, and many other topics. So today, he will be talking about stellar population studies in the j pass survey. So. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. So, uh, well, uh, first of all, thanks for attending this seminar. Uh, and also, uh, at any time during this seminar, if you have any question, don't hesitate to raise your hand for making a question or whatever, for me there is no problem. And also, uh, and now, uh, during this seminar, uh, I'm going to present part of the stellar population studies that we are uh, doing uh, within the j collaboration, and in particular, I will focus on those star population studies in which I have participated more deeply as well as those that, uh, the ones that I have led uh, with the collaboration. So during the seminar, I will, I start the, the seminar uh, with a brief introduction of the JPAS survey, as well as the techniques that we are, uh, that we have been performing uh, in order to constrain the stellar population properties of galaxies. Later, I also introduced part of the uh, scientific results that we have obtained within the JPAS collaboration, of course, about the stellar populations of galaxies. Later, I will also present uh, more recent results that we have been obtaining. In particular, we will focus on the stellar mass and luminosity functions that we have uh, constrained uh, in the paper that we have submitted a couple of months ago. And finally, I will present the current work and the ongoing projects that we have uh, here about the stellar population studies for, for the future. Okay, so let's start. As many of you know, uh, during the last decades, uh, there is an increasing number of lyric scale multi-filter surveys, especially in the optical range, that are demonstrating to be an excellent, uh, to provide an excellent set of data to, to study uh, many different topics in astronomy and, and astrophysics. In fact, this kind of, of surveys um, present uh, really nice advantages uh, uh, to take into account. For instance, uh, these surveys, uh, uh, there is no, uh, no selection bias for them because uh, you are imagining uh, part of the sky, so there is no appreciation of sources. And also typically the flux calibration uh, of, the, of the bands is, is typically very, uh, really nice. In addition, and uh, with similar telescopes and, and with the uh, uh, same notion of time, typically uh, these photometric surveys uh, can reach uh, a depth that is higher than uh, other, uh, for instance, uh, spectroscopic surveys. And, and the photometry is not affected by aperture bias because basically for each of the sources in the images, you define a, a custom, not a custom, but uh, the proper aperture to integrate all the flux coming from different sources in the images. And uh, also, typically from images, it's very easy to, to get uh, the photometry for each of the pieces of the sky that in some cases could be, in, can be very interesting for especially result studies. And uh, also uh, the most um, uh, state of art of the art uh, uh, multi-filter surveys like the, like the case of, of JPAS are uh, including a, a large set of narrow bands and that uh, and this kind of data is halfway between uh, classical photometry and uh, 
and um, low resolution spectra. So for this reason, we used to call uh, this kind of data G spectrum in the collaboration. So due to, to the configuration of this uh, of this uh, multi-filter service like J Pass, uh, uh, the the possibilities that we have to explore uh, uh, many topics in astronomy is really large. And here, for instance, I mean, uh, just to illustrate this, uh, I'm showing the the kind of uh, of working groups that we have in our collaboration. That you can see that this um, can be very uh, uh, different, uh, ranging from cosmology to star transients and galaxy evolution studies, as is my case. I'm not going to give all the details about this. And in our particular case, we are interested in the stellar populations of galaxies. So uh, right now, uh, what during the last uh, years, we were exploring the potential of uh, uh, JPAS-like surveys in, in order to perform stellar population studies of galaxies. And also, we were working and uh, preparing all the techniques and methodologies for this kind of data. So first of all, uh, I'm going to give a very brief uh, introduction to the JPAS survey for the JPAS survey. So basically, it's a, as I said, it's a large scale multi filter survey that started uh, in, uh, in the uh, last October 2023 and it is planned to observe uh, in the optical range an area larger than 8,000 square degrees that uh, is going to mainly observe. Uh, the northern sky uh, hemisphere, but also is going to serve a, a small part of the southern one. So the survey is carrying out uh, by uh, obs uh, from Observatorio Astrofísico Javalambre in Teruel, Spain. Here uh, we can see a picture of the telescope that is going to 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 carry out this this the, the imaging of of this survey is uh, here. You can see that. Uh, the most important features of uh, for the telescope and uh, for the observatory, and here is just to illustrate the uh, the JPCAM, which is the instrument that is going to to observe the this survey, which is mainly composed of fourteen physics series, and as you can see, the field of view is, is very large. Also, you have uh, many more details here in the web, or also here in the in these papers. So the main uh, characteristic of this survey is uh, the, photo, uh, the, um, the photometric system. As you can see here, it's composed of uh, 54 narrow bands with a full uh, with half maximum, uh, a bit lower than uh, 150 angstroms that were complemented with two broad bands, uh, well, actually two intermediate uh, bands in the blue or in the red. And also, it includes uh, four uh, slow like uh, broadbands. So, given the peculiarities of this uh, photometric system, which one of the key uh, goals of the project is to uh, determine uh, precise uh, photometric precision. With this uh, photometric system, we expect to get more uh, than uh, one hundred million galaxies with the, this photometric precision, and for uh, about 1% in precision for photometric resistance for more than 300 million galaxies once the uh, survey is finished. So as I uh, said before, this survey uh, started uh, by the end of uh, last year. However, uh, we have a preliminary, a preliminary data set that we call a uh, mini GPAS in order to test the, uh, the potential of GPAS also, uh, uh, well, this survey is called uh, mini GPAS. You have all the details in, in this reference. And uh, also, one of the goals of, of the mini GPAS survey was to, uh, to test the performance of the telescope as well as to uh, perform a first scientific exploitation of, of this kind of data. So, this, uh, the configuration of this. Uh, Mini bus survey was conceived to be as close as possible as the one for the JPAS survey. 
The only difference is the, is the camera that it's used for, for the imaging that is a bit different is only composed of uh, one CCD. And for this reason, uh, the field of view is, is much smaller than the, than the one for the Midipass survey. And here you can see the footprint of the Midipass survey, which is uh, centered in the AGS field. So for this reason, it overlaps with other very well known surveys like the standard crop strip, uh, the uh, HSC, and also uh, Alamba. One of the main features that we can uh, summarize here uh, for the mini pass survey is that it also uh, was observed using the same photometric system that, uh, that extracted for JPAS. The uh, completeness of the detection of the catalogs for galaxies is uh, up to uh, magnitude 22.7 for the year one, and for point like sources, this completeness lim uh, limit uh, is at 23.6. The total uh, effective area of the survey is uh, a bit less than one square degree. And we check, well, we check it in the paper by uh, Caballero uh, et al, uh, 2021 that the precision for the photometrics is already uh, achieved for the mini pass survey. So in order to perform our stellar population studies, um, well, it's also worth mentioning here that uh, in the rest of the slides, all the results that I'm going to show were obtained using uh, real data for uh, the mini pass survey. Okay, so in order to constrain the stellar population properties of galaxies using this kind of uh, of data, we have been uh, developing uh, tools, and in particular, in my personal case, I was uh, putting a lot of efforts in, uh, in the development of self-fitting techniques in order to constrain the stellar population properties of galaxies. Uh, in my case, I'm using the, uh, the self-fitting code uh, MAFIT, which is the code that I started to develop during my PhD. But also in our stellar population group, we have another self-fitting code that is called uh, the SIGA. And basically, as you can see, this uh, self-fitting codes are, uh, have a lot of common uh, features. And the uh, main differences are, are uh, um, in, the, in the models that we use to uh, constrain the stellar population properties of galaxies. So for MAFIT, we are using a, a non-parametric star formation history, in particular, a two-vast uh, model. And basically, you is using a parametric star formation history for, for building the, the models. And uh, one of the things that I have been working in the last years here since I started my uh, postdoc here is that also MAFIT is including as another free parameter the photometric physics and also including the, the uncertainties in the determination of this parameter to perform the, the self fitting analysis of. Of galaxies. Here, for instance, we can see uh, uh, a case of um, of the uh, probability distribution function of a photometric recipe of a faint source in uh, in many past. And you can see that in faint sources, in general, these uh, functions are very complex. And in, in some cases, in the fainter, uh, in the faintest objects, also present uh, multimodal distributions that you can see here. The, 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 in this case, the three peaks, but as, as, as I said, is a very faint galaxy in, in many JPAS. But the code for a general case is also including this information during the self fitting analysis. And as a result, from the self fitting, we uh, can obtain uh, also uh, luminosities for all the bands, stellar masses for the galaxies, reflect colors, H metallicity, extinction, and also all these uh, parameters with uncertainties and, and correlations. And also during the next slides, I'm, all the results that I'm going to, to show are based in the, in the results that we are, I obtained with my self fitting code. So here, I illustrate two self-fitting cases of two galaxies, of two real galaxies from mini j that we uh, obtained with, uh, 
with uh, uh, in, in, in red and in black is the photometry from the, the catalog and you can see that for this panel is a is a repeating result for a, a luminous red galaxy at resin 0.55 in mini j pass and uh, is it, um, it's interesting that even at this recipe, we can get a very really nice photometry that um, allow us to see some of the typical spectral features that we can uh, expect from this kind of galaxies. For instance, we can see the magnesium band, we can see the 4,000 break, also the G band, etc. And uh, just to illustrate this and the quality of, uh, of the results, for this uh, red galaxy we obtain that is typically old with uh, an, an age uh, close to 9.8 is um, super solar uh, metal uh, with a super solar metallicity, low extinction, and here uh, you can see the, that is also very massive. And on, on the right panel, it's a, a more noisy case. But it's uh, to illustrate that even for uh, uh, emission line galaxies uh, uh, with very low stellar mass uh, to receive 0.22, uh, 0.25, sorry, uh, we are able to provide a, a good fit to the continuum of the galaxy. And also we are able to detect emission lines. In this case, uh, here we have H alpha, and here we have uh, O3 and uh, H beta. And expected for this kind of galaxies, the, the, the H is typically below one giga year. Uh, Subsolar metallicities extinction is larger than for uh, uh, quiescent galaxies. And the stellar mass is very low. So, also, using our fitting results, we performed a first study about the stellar content of, of the galaxies in, in mini pass. We did this in the work by uh, Rosa Gonzalez Delgado et al. 2021. And uh, in this case, we studied the reliability and the consistency of the results in order to characterize the uncertainties and, and the stellar population's properties of galaxies using this kind of data. Here, for instance, just to illustrate, we see uh, the uh, stellar mass versus uh, color uh, correction for extinction diagram, okay? In order to check all this. And we see that depending on the, uh, of the position that uh, galaxies lies in, in, within this kind of diagrams, the positions are very correlated with the stellar uh, co uh, population properties of galaxies. Here uh, on the top, we can see the, the so-called uh, resequent galaxies. And here in the bottom, we can see yeah. the, the star forming galaxies. So uh, for instance, we found that the typical, also the typical properties that we uh, can expect uh, from uh, other star population studies. For instance, the correlation between the age and mass, the correlation between metallicity and mass, and also the typical parameters that we obtain for quite some galaxies that are typically more massive than the star forming ones. For instance, in the, in the near universe, they are typically old, and the metallicity, the metal content is also typically larger than in, in star forming galaxies. But also uh, within the collaboration, we uh, perform another test and we explore if we were able to uh, determine the cosmic evolution of the star formation uh, red, uh, density of the universe uh, using galaxies from Inigibas. In this case, we selected galaxies uh, in this uh, recipe bin. And using the results that we obtained from our self-fitting codes for this exercise, uh, also in the, col in the collaboration, we are uh, three uh, active groups working on this uh, in this moment, and we have four self-fitting codes. And for the four self-fitting codes, we found that the, star for the cosmic evolution of the star formation uh, uh, rate density that we obtained for the same sample of galaxies 
in all the cases was compatible with other previous spectroscopic studies and uh, from the, uh, the literature. So in, uh, in something that also I was working in, in the last year, in the last year, sorry, it was that I was um, trying to, uh, to find a method to perform a classification of galaxies, a spectral type classification of galaxies only using this kind of data without using any kind of spectroscopic data or whatever. So in the beginning, we started to explore, for instance, the, uh, the well-known uh, color color diagrams or the star formation rate versus stellar mass diagrams. And in particular, we found that it was very interesting and uh, very efficient to, to perform the, this classification. And, and uh, the best candidate that we found using the GPAS like data, it, it was the stellar mass versus color diagram but the color is corrected for extinction. Okay. So uh, making use of this diagram, we uh, were able uh, to determine a color limit as a function of the stellar mass, as a function also of the resid in order to uh, perform the classification of galaxies uh, as a function of the spectral time. Here, for instance, we have the, the plot that we obtained in that moment that is also included in the in the presentation paper of the Minilipa survey. And uh, we found that it, uh, that it was very reliable uh, or, and very effective in order to determine this, uh, to this uh, spectral type classification. Also, uh, during more recently, during the last years uh, since I arrived here in the, uh, at the Institute of Astrophysical Andalusia, I also worked in uh, improve a bit more this uh, this diagram. And for instance, uh, I, my aim was to assign also probabilities to this classification, okay? Because uh, as you know, uh, the stellar masses, the red spring colors, the also even the red seed typically include uncertainties in the in the determination of these parameters. So typically, uh, they are uh, are not plotted, but uh, there are error bars that in some cases uh, tell you that um, the classification is not so uh, clear. So for this. I developed a method to compute the, this probability and depending in the, of the position the, uh, of, the, of the galaxies within these diagrams, also taking into account the correlations among all the parameters and the errors, we, are, uh, we assign a probability to be Poisson or to be star forming. So here uh, uh, I plot these probabilities the 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 bluer the the probability is lower okay so that means that the probability is higher has to be a star forming galaxy and uh, on the other hand when the redder the more quiescent is is the galaxy and the higher is the probability we are we are quiescent galaxy uh, and here is easy to see that when also, when we are close to the, to the color limit that is uh, is detailed by, by this equation, the probability tends to be close to uh, 0.5. So in principle, this classification is working very well, and later I will show also why. So also for the collaboration, it uh, is uh, very interesting to, um, well, for the collaboration and also for, for our aims um, to study the stellar population uh, of galaxies, it's very important to define the completeness or the limits of, of our samples, especially because these samples are flux limited samples, which means that the proper flux limit is introduction of bias in the selection of our galaxy samples. So, for a proper determination of these limits, we developed some uh, techniques that, uh, or some methods that 
were uh, originally based on the World by Possetti at all 2010. But we were working a lot in order to improve these, uh, these methods. And also we parameterize the, uh, we provide analytical functions in order to determine the, the continuous limits for stellar mass and for, for luminosity also as a function of receive for uh, any completeness level and also uh, depending on the uh, on the limit that we use to define our flux in the depth sample. Here, for instance, for, uh, to illustrate all this, we are, uh, well, also it was mentioned here that we perform this analysis for a start for me and for a question analysis because of obvious reasons. Because typically uh, samples of star forming galaxies are um, deeper than that the comparison was. And here, for instance, we illustrate for a flux limited sample or for a magnitude uh, lower than uh, r equal to 22. This will be the completeness limit of the sample from mini J pass. The data line will be for a uh, fifty percent completeness level, and the uh, total line for five uh, percent. And these are the uh, completeness limits for stellar mass for star forming and for quasar. All these details are there in the paper that we submitted a couple of weeks ago. So also in um, in the uh, Within our star population group, uh, we uh, we aim at developing a methodology in order to uh, determine the luminosity and the star mass functions of galaxies. And the idea was also to include all the results that we were obtaining with all the information that we were obtaining from uh, our separating analysis. So uh, when I arrive here, I started to develop these methods and the method is uh, based uh, in the, uh, so, I mean, it determines the, uh, the star mass and luminosity functions. And in particular is based, uh, is fitting the, the sector function that typically are very well, uh, well known in astronomy. As you know, this parametric uh, luminosity and star mass functions depend on three parameters. That is the characteristic luminosity, the characteristic star mass. These uh, coefficients alpha and beta are related to the faint end slopes of, of the functions and also the normalization, where the normalization provides the, uh, the typical uh, number density of, of galaxies. So in order to perform all this analysis, uh, there is a large set of inputs that we need. So for instance, we need the, the area of the, the footprint that in our case is 8.9 square degrees for mini j pass. Also, we need the photometric receive in order to, uh, to, to perform the set fitting analysis. We also need a star galaxy classification, okay? Yeah, because we are interested uh, on in galaxies, of course, because these are the luminosity and star mass functions of galaxies, and we use the uh, uh, the fluxes for all the sources in order to perform the analysis. And also, we had uh, we studied these these functions uh, as a uh, Taking into account the spectral type classification of galaxies, which is very common for this kind of studies, because the, as I'll show later, these functions typically evolve differently depending on the on the spectral type of the galaxies. We also needed the stellar masses and restrained luminosities for each of the galaxies, which in, in this case were obtained using uh, the circuit in code method. And we also needed the luminosity and the stellar mass complement that I showed in the, in the previous slide. So here, uh, this, this plot is just to illustrate the typical uncertainties uh, for the luminosities and for stellar masses that we are obtaining in the, in the survey right now. 
So as you can see, the these uncertainties depend on the spectral type and also depend on the uh, on the on the on the right of the of each of, of the sources as expected. So typically, a, a larger recessive uncertainties are allowed as expected. And also we find, we found that for quite galaxies, interpreters are typically lower than for star forming galaxies. So the method that we developed in order to constrain the stellar mass and luminosity functions uh, is based on a maximum likelihood method uh, for which we also use uh, Monte, uh, Monte Carlo Markov chains uh, method for sampling the posterior distribution, which is shown here. And we introduce that the faint the slope, the characteristic parameters, and the normalizations are uh, linear functions with rest. Also, we introduce a term that controls the uh, star galaxy classification, the spectral type, the completeness, and many other features, and also typically the, the quality of the photometric regressive and many things are, are of interest for, for this. And finally, also this method, uh, owing to the distribution of errors that I showed in the, in the previous slide, uh, we found needed to uh, correct these luminosity functions for editor bias effects. So here, this is the typical uh, corner uh, plot that we obtain uh, for the determination of the, in this case, for the uh, stellar uh, mass functions of quiet galaxies. You can see here the parameters that we found and the uncertainties for each of the parameters. And uh, here in the posterior distribution, uh, these dozen lines illustrate the 68% uh, level. Okay, so finally, after doing all this analysis, here on the left, we can see the the luminosity, uh, uh, luminos yeah, the luminosity functions for uh, star forming galaxies, and on the right, the uh, luminosity functions for uh, quasar galaxies in the mini J passari as a different recipe. Okay, as you can see, the and uh, finally what we found as a, also as something that is very well known that from uh, previous studies and from. Uh, much deeper photometric surveys that the uh, faint uh, uh, slope of the luminosity function of star forming galaxies is very constant, science uh, received more or less one, and the, uh, the changes of, for these functions are typically concentrated in the uh, in the right end of, of the functions. And here is the same, but for quiescent galaxies, uh, as it was observed in previous surveys, this uh, evolution of this function changes more than for the star forming case. Okay. Also, solid lines illustrate the luminosity ranges for which uh, the mini G pass uh, uh, survey uh, is complete. And does the lines correspond to, to the part that is not complete? Now, this is the same, but for uh, uh, the, star, uh, the stellar mass functions. Okay? And again, for star forming gases and for uh, coincident galaxies on, on the right. Um, so, in lines, you can see that as for the luminosity functions, the stellar uh, functions of quite uh, sorry of uh, star forming galaxies are typically constant uh, at the uh, front end, uh, and in this case, for the less massive end of the stellar mass functions, and uh, there is typically an evolution in the, the high mass end of these functions. And also for quiescent galaxies, as is well now, at uh, decreasing recessive, the, there is an increasing number of quiescent uh, galaxies in the most massive part. Okay, but also there is a, a, a much more remarkable effect in the 
in the less massive part in which uh, we found that the number of Python galaxies uh, with star masses below typically 10 to the 5 increases uh, at decreasing massive. So also here is remarkable that uh, the, the effect of the uh, of the editon bias, okay, these lines here illustrate with uh, how would be the, the stellar mass function that we obtain uh, for star forming galaxies in the case that we don't correct for editon bias. And solid lines are illustrated after correcting uh, for editon bias. Also, this effect. Here is no is less clear because uh, there are a lot of lines that overlap each other, but also the effect is very very important. Also, it's interesting to to obtain in many times to obtain the fraction of red galaxies that um, we can typically obtain uh, in in galaxy surveys. For uh, this fraction of red galaxies is very easy to obtain once we have determine the stellar mass and the, uh, the luminosity functions. So basically, if you divide the, the, the stellar mass and luminosity functions of calling galaxies between the, the total of galaxies in the sample, you can get this, this, uh, these plots here. And typically, as I suspected, uh, at uh, size ratio is one more or less, the more uh, more massive galaxies are typically quite thin galaxies. And for uh, less massive galaxies, uh, less massive galaxies are typically dominated by star forming galaxies. So here is again the, the luminosity function and the uh, stellar mass uh, function of uh, star forming and quite galaxies at different rates. But now we are comparing our results with uh, other results from the uh, literature uh, from deeper spectroscopic, uh, no, sorry, from deep, uh, deeper uh, photometric uh, surveys. And also we include uh, results from spectroscopic surveys. And we can see that typically the same for all the functions and all the and at any recipe are will reproduce with the results that we are obtaining uh, using classes from the uh, class. And this is the same, but in this case, what we are showing is the stellar mass functions of, of classes that but also we are getting very nice results. Another interesting parameter that we can compute from uh, the stellar mass and luminosity functions is the cosmic evolution of the uh, of the stellar mass density and the cosmic evolution of the luminosity uh, density. Okay. As uh, before, uh, here we are also uh, confronting our results with the results from the literature, and uh, we can see that uh, uh, for uh, both spect uh, spectral types. Uh, we are obtaining uh, results that are well reproduced, but by other surveys. Uh, in blue uh, is for uh, star forming, in red for quite and black. The black line uh, illustrates the total population of galaxies. And as obtained by previous surveys, what we are getting is that the luminosity density decreases at decreasing recipe. And uh, about the, the stellar mass density, we find that this one is increasing at uh, decreasing velocity. Uh, and also we find that typically the stellar mass density that we find in, in star forming galaxies is, is close to uh, no evolution. And this evolution is dominated by the quite population. And this plot is just to illustrate the, the results that we are obtaining with the method that we developed uh, here, uh, since I started my, my postdoc here, in comparison with the results that we will obtain using the traditional, uh, traditional methods, for instance, the Sandage uh, method or the Vmax method. 
using only traditional methods, we are uh, we are very limited in order to determine, in this case, the cosmic evolution of the luminosity density. And above resin point four, we will obtain that these parameters are very, very okay. And this will be the same, but now for in the, the cosmic evolution of, of the stellar mass density. So now this is my the last part of the of the seminar. And here I'm going to uh, briefly introduce the the tool that in this case my PhD student Julio is uh, developing here as part of his PhD here at the Instituto de Astrofísica Andalucía. And uh, uh, it consists in a tool that is, is planned to, uh, to study the distribution of the stellar content of galaxies, and especially resolved galaxies uh, that were observed in, in photometric surveys like JPAS. So uh, this tool is divided mainly in four uh, stages or parts. Okay. And because it's planned to be uh, also an automatic tool that in the first step uh, for a list of candidates that are especially resolved in the in the, in the photometric catalogs, it takes um, a stamp or uh, an image for each of the ones of the survey to subsequently uh, uh, apply a, a point is a PSF homogenization of the images for each of the bands. Okay, so here we we see the original image in the R band, and here we see the image after the PSF homogenization. Where in this case uh, we are taking the worst PSF that we found for all uh, for all the bands. Okay. This step is very important. Uh, uh, we found that this step is very important, especially when we want to determine the stellar population properties of galaxies in the most inner regions of the, uh, of the galaxies. As we can see here, before the uh, homogenization would correspond to the, to, the, to the red dots that we see here, okay, is our magnitudes versus uh, the effective wavelengths for each of the of the bands in the in the mini bus survey, and this will be the photo spectrum after the PSI communication. But it's also true that when we explore uh, the the set of of the different regions of the galaxies, when we are in the outer regions, the PSI homogenization is less relevant than in the in the very inner parts. So finally, not finally, but later after the piece of homogenization, also these two mask all the uh, all the source uh, all the sources, including foreground and background sources with respect to the uh, galaxy that uh, under study, in order to provide the the correct photometry for different regions of, of the galaxy. So now finally. We are exploring different methods in order also to define regions for each of the um, spatially resolved galaxies. Right now, we are uh, we started to work with uh, elliptical apertures, and these two finally extract the, the photometry for each of the regions. Okay, and later we once we get this photometry, we send the photometry to our search fitting codes in order to determine the star population properties for each of the regions. And this way, we are able to analyze the distribution of the star population of these galaxies. So here is just to illustrate one of the, the results that we are obtaining in particular in the mini pass survey, there is a, a galaxy that is also included in the manga sample. And here we illustrate the stellar mass uh, surface density of stellar mass that we obtain using this tool. And I don't know if you can see here the star, these star shape markers illustrate the values that were obtained for the same regions for Magda. And also, this is to illustrate that the potential of this kind of studies, because here with Manga, 
uh, you can more or less determine all the parameters up to uh, one effective radius, but with uh, the JPAS images, in this case, we were able to extend this profile up to uh, still up to uh, an effective radius equal to three. And click in the account that once the pass is complete, uh, uh, we plan that we can provide resolved star population properties and ionized guys distribution of galaxies up to two uh, 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 between two and three hundred radius, but for more than one uh, hundred thousand uh, galaxies. And also, these are very preliminary results, but basically it's just to illustrate the typical uh, radial profiles for uh, the different uh, radial profiles for stellar population properties that we are obtaining for a subsample of 24 quasi-stem galaxies that are more massive than 10.7 uh, solar masses. And we can see that for these cases, we are obtaining that the typical radial profile for 4 is close to be flat, as it was measured in, in the previous surveys. The inner parts of, of massive quasi galaxies are typically uh, have, uh, solar and supersolar metallicities, and in the outer parts, these values decreases uh, down to uh, uh, solar um, metallicities. And uh, typically, these galaxies at 70% emission line. Uh, that's percent emission okay so this is the last slide here uh summarize here all the takeaway uh, conclusions that that uh, I presented here today so just uh, remind me that uh, we are ready to perform very potential stellar populations with the ongoing JPA survey, it will be extra population properties. And also it's very interesting that in the future, we can explore also these properties in terms of environment and radial profiles. And as the uh, JPA survey has started, we expect to do all this in the very good future. So thank you very much. Thank you. So now it's time for questions. So for people in the room, please speak loud so that people in Zoom can hear you. And for people listening in Zoom, if you have, have questions, please raise your hands. So who wants to start? Uh, can you show us again if, if the beginning of your talk uh, a plot of what's U minus R versus the mass of the gap? Oh, this slide before. This yeah, one? This one. I love that expert in the subject. Um, I had to figure out what does it this plot mean? I mean, there are two bulks of data. One, the biggest one, mm -hmm. see the lower part of this diagram, and another one up there. Yeah. What do they mean? This is the density of sources here. Sorry? The density of sources in the, in the plot. Can you speak longer, please? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Is the is the density of sources in the in the in the plot? This means that there are more sources here than in, in, in this part. No, okay, I, I've got it. But I, I um, how, um, why I do do two bulks of data? They they have different distinct uh, colors, especially. They, they oh differ, yes, they, they differ by uh, one order of magnitude, but different. They differ mostly from their colors. Why is that? This is because star forming galaxies are typically four times more frequent than white and galaxies or, red, uh, or galaxies in the red cloud versus the galaxies in the blue sequence. Okay, so in the slide, in the, the next case. slide, this gap doesn't appear. Here. No, because I'm not plotting these levels here. Here we are illustrating the probability of these galaxies, but it's the same plot. Okay. So here is you plot uh, again the density uh, curves of, 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 of galaxies. You will see that here also there are many more galaxies in this region than in this region. But typically, it's a factor of four. Yeah. 
Thank you very much for your talks. Something very interesting to me. Uh, yeah, Stella, but here we are talking about something very similar to what we find over in the general population. But uh, coming back to the previous uh, slide, so, so here it is supposed there is not previous bias in the equation of the um, just. No? So mm -hmm. it is the typical snapshot of the galaxy population uh, in this uh, redshift interval. Mm -hmm. And coming back to the next one. So, what do you tell me here? What kind of methodology do you use for obtaining the uh, probability? Well, the probability is computed from the uh, the change of value that we get from a Monte Carlo simulation for the set fitting analysis for each of the galaxies. So just get a set of photometric residue values, a set of stellar mass values, and a set of uh, uh, version colors covered for the station. Okay. So what you get is uh, okay, like having all these. Basically, this change includes the correlations and uncertainties. Okay, so from there, there is a fraction of, of, of points or of simulations that are going to be above this uh, this limit that depends on uh, stellar mass, resid, and color. And there is another fraction that is below this this region. I think that this region is, is not a line; it's a plane. Okay. So basically, you isolate what's the fraction of probability that is above and the fraction that of probability that is below. Okay. Okay. Thank you. When you show me your map, I'm not the mass function is in as compared to the other results or the previous results. Yeah, those loads. You said, I think you said that they are comparable, but I, um, in the uh, for the uh, less, I mean, for the fainter galaxies, in some cases, uh, we can see that the triangles are quite a bit different from the other ones. So, could you explain that, please? Well, these are the results from beepers. So, I think that the main difference is because uh, the completeness of, of the completeness li uh, limit of, of beepers. So, basically, they only fit the most bright part. And basically, this component, well, this part of the cube is more or less free, let's say. However, when you include results from much deeper uh, services such as Cosmos or uh, Alhambra, also for, well, for stellar masses, we don't have the, the, the functions for from beepers. Oops, sorry. But typically, when you compare the results with much deeper, with much deeper results, typically is everything is more or less in the same area. Let's say the step deeper. Can I ask another question? Um, uh, do you think it could be possible to somewhat answer about what you get here from so many filters with the upcoming very deep? Service that will be done with uh, just several filters, as the case of Robin. Mm. So, you mean to do the same but for uh, deeper surveys with less bands? Or... You can do the same because you will have just four or five uh, filters, but in, in some way, try to answer what you get here from what you could get from a much smaller number of filters and broader mm -hmm. filters and, and, and try to do. Uh, Something. In principle, if all the errors or the uh, uh, probability distribution functions and all the correlations are well determined, yes, because basically this is a probability uh, analysis. I mean, you are going to determine the, the surface with the highest probability that we uh, reproduce your sample of observation, let's say. But it's true that is uh, what we found is that uh, it's very important that all the probability distribution functions are very well determined, and the correlations are also very well determined or are we that? Let's see. Well, thank you, Luis, for the lecture. And just uh, 
uh, sacraments, maybe you can elaborate why uh, the evolution of the, of the properties and the are you doing until 0.7 in residues and no more or no less? And what the significance of this? Is this, this is because of the survey, but can you elaborate more? And what is this, the significance of this in relation to the evolution you see? Whether there is a, a monotonous evolution or you see on mass functions, uh, or in the word one, or do you notice something critical near point eight? It's a completeness. Because the completeness about resid point seven is around here. So basically, you have a few galaxies here that the the only mini uh, I mean the only pack of this galaxy that they introduce a lot of noise here. So um, I found that um, uh, it's not necessary to go um, much and at, at higher resid because basically there is no information to constrain anything. And the fit is very well determined at lower resid because the information that are that um, uh, glasses at even here me is more there. At higher resid, they are only saying mm, a bit here, but the rest is, is completely uncertain because you don't see the galas and you are not including galaxies in, the, in, in your shuttle. So that, that's the reason. But also, it's because the number of quiet and galaxies start to increase very fast at resid higher than 0.7. So basically, maybe you are around here. Okay. Yeah. So, but this is nothing critical in point nine, something like that, or do you expect something? So it is smoothly. No, smoothly so you can see here, for instance, okay, for uh, unicity functions in Maurice, you see that still you have galaxies here, okay, this is point eight. But the for stellar masses is, is more critical, and some of them start to disappear here. And for quite galaxies, basically about 0 0.8, 0 0.9, you have a dozen of them. More questions? Okay, if not, so let's thank Luis. Thank you.